somehow this situation we're in looks like something where to our ancestors, this was a good time to cut back on fertility. That's the instinct we're reacting on. Somehow this environment we're going, oh, well, this is a good time to cut back. But of course, in some objective sense, that's kind of crazy. It's not a good time to cut back, but our evolved instincts are clearly telling us, no, 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 this is the time to cut back. Growth Minds. Whether it's your first time here or you've been here before, I'm curious to know what it is that brought you here. And if you can, smash that like button below. It really helps spread our message to more people. All right, on to the episode. Robin, thanks so much for making it on the show. Nice to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you. So you wrote uh, the book. Is it is the full book called Elephant in the Brain? Uh, well, that's the title. There's a subtitle. Okay. Hidden Motives in Everyday Life. That's it. Which gives most people a better idea what it's about. Right. And this is obviously plain words and the idea of the elephant in the room. Uh, talk to us a, a, a bit about the title choice and, and why um, elephant in the room is generally means like there's something so obvious in the room that everybody in the room knows about but isn't really going to be comfortable talking about. So how does this uh, play on words apply to our brains and the way we think? So the book is co-authored with um, a man named Kevin Simler. And we followed his lead more on style and things like the title and my lead more on sort of the, the basic concepts that we had you know, organized the book around. And so I wasn't that impressed with the title really myself. But, uh, <laughs> I like it. Seems it. to have been successful. <laughs> I like it, yeah. Uh, it, it's in this general theme of sort of a cute, clever title. It doesn't actually tell you that much about something. And then you uh, augment it with a subtitle. Which that, is why the subtitle is so Oh, important. that's what it's about. No, right? exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Whereas I'm, I'm just much more literal and direct about things in the sense that I try to just say everything as clearly and directly and simply as possible. We, we brought the right author on then. I mean, let's mind. get right to the point, right? Uh, but I mean, the, the concept is that um, there's this thing that you kind of know about, but don't like to admit. And it's really big and important. <laughs> and it's not just in some situations, in some awkward cases where there's a thing you don't want to talk about. There's this thing in your life, in your brain that is that is usually there. And it's there a lot and it's important and you are also not very willing to even notice that it's there or talk about it hmm. that's it's as if to say there's this really big thing <laughs> that you are not talking about it's not and much bigger than you probably expected <laughs> so sure. uh the basic theme of the book is that you're often wrong about your motives and i think everybody admits that this is a thing that could happen sometimes, that sometimes some people are self-deceived about something, uh, but much harder to think that it's true about yourself and even most of us most of the time. That's a much more surprising claim that we're making in the book is that, in fact, much of the time you're just wrong about why you're doing things. Yeah. And so the first third of the book tries to explain why, in general, it might be that you're wrong about why you do things. Uh, but that's not going to be enough to convince you. <laughs> then we need to show you that in many particular cases you're wrong. And so the meat of the book is the last two thirds where we go through 10 different areas of life. And then for each one, try to convince you <laughs> that you're wrong. <laughs> and so the way we do that is in each area, we describe the usual story, the usual thing you would say about why you do that thing, why you talk, why you go to the doctor, why you go to school, why you vote. And then we'll list a number of puzzles of patterns of behavior related to that that don't fit very well with the simple story you'd give. And then we offer an alternative story that we suggest fits better with these puzzles mm. and is basically a story of an alternative motive that you have that you're not very aware of, but it makes more sense of what you're doing. You are successfully achieving this other purpose. And uh, it's a decent, plausible purpose, and it's a purpose you might reasonably want to be achieving, but you aren't very aware of that. You are, you'll tell the story of this other purpose 
the usual purpose, and uh, we'll have to convince you through these puzzles. Yeah, it reminds me of the chart that I'm sure some people have heard, which is you've got a pie chart that talks about the amount of information that you know, which in a grand scheme of things is not super great, or, uh, or at least you think it's great, but for most people, it's not. I mean, it's probably going to be 10%, 15% of all the knowledge out there, probably less. And then there is a slightly bigger chart that takes over, which is a uh, part of the chart, sorry, which is what you know you don't know. And then you've got pretty much the rest of the chart, of the pie chart, which is what you don't know, you don't know. And it's just this blind spot that all people have, but there's only so much that we think we know that it's going to be a very confusing for people, but um, people don't even know where to start figuring out where the hidden biases are in their brains. And we just kind of make decisions automatically without even thinking about why we're making decisions this way. So my first question is, um, why has evolution been set up so that these motives and uh, are, are quite hidden from us. It's almost like we're trying to shy away from it. So that is you know, one of the basic questions in this area. Why would we try to hide? Why, why not admit these things? But first we have to commit, convince you that you are by again, going through these specific examples and then try to show you why you might not be aware. So, the key story is that your conscious mind, the, the thing I'm talking to right now, you are not the president or king of your mind. You talk that way, you act as if you're in charge and you get to decide what happens, but that's not really who you are. You're the press secretary. Your job is to watch what happens and make up stories about why that was all great and good and fine and nobody should complain. That's what a press secretary does. And the press secretary doesn't often know what the king or president does or why. They don't need to know the real reasons that might get in the way of coming up with a good story for why, why what was done was completely reasonable. So you uh, came from a very social species and your distant ancestors were so social that that social environment was the most important environment they were in. It was the thing that mattered most, hmm. whether they lived or died or succeeded, or prospered, mainly depended on their social environment, that the people around them might trust them, accept them, respect them. Uh, that was the big thing that mattered. And humans developed social norms, that is rules about who should do what and not do what in various situations. And these norms were essential to managing the larger groups that our ancestors could manage much larger than other primates could manage and much more effective. And these social norms, you know, told what you should do and what you should not do. And it was really important for you to avoid being accused of violating the norms. And it was really helpful if you could find a way to accuse your rivals of violating the norms. And so you develop this part of your mind, this conscious part of your mind, whose main job is to watch what you're doing all the time and tell stories about why you did it, good stories, acceptable stories about why it was all for perfectly decent reasons and therefore not a norm violation because many of our norms have motives connected to them. So if I hit you on purpose, that's a pretty big norm violation. If I accidentally hit you, not so much of a problem. So if I hit you, I want to be able to say that was an accident. Mm. I need to be able to construct a whole story about how I was going along and I wasn't paying attention. I didn't notice you were there and I tried to do this other thing and it slipped and then I hit you. And that's what your mind is doing all the time. Whatever you're doing, you're saying, what could somebody accuse me of doing here? <laughs> what other story could I have that would, you know, contradict that and then make me seem okay. And try to make sure all the time, whatever you're doing, you've got a good story about what you were doing and why. This is that's a way to protect ourselves. What your mind is doing. And that's why you don't know why, what the real reasons for what you're doing. That's not your job to know the real reasons. Your job is to have a good story. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. So, and you're saying this is a way for us to protect ourselves because if we were to not have these normal stories, then we would be banished from tribes back in the day. We would have enemies that could potentially threaten our lives. 
it's just ingrained into our human psychology as a way to survive. We, we need to tell a good story about ourselves so we will be seen as a person in good standing. And of course, to notice chances to undermine our rivals by describing what they're doing as terrible violations of the rules. Hmm. Yeah. And, and I guess some people, we, we kind of deceive ourselves too. Cause I'm, as you said that literally decisions I've certainly made quite recently about where I'm going to be moving. It doesn't necessarily have to be things that we've done wrong either, right? It's, it's, it's any decision that we make. We try to justify what is a good story that we can tell our friends, our parents, um, our colleagues about why we did what we did. And it's probably not the real reason but it's something that we make up in our heads that can shine us in the best light possible or that can make the most sense to them, even though there's probably a darker reason or a completely different reason that justifies that. Now, the real reasons that you have for your behavior are mostly pretty reasonable things. Uh, they make sense as reasons. They may not look quite as good, but they are decent things to have. Nevertheless, they make you more vulnerable to these sorts of accusations. And so, right. They're reasonable to us, to say for like us. logically, but if we were to share that in public, maybe this isn't going to there be we're just more vulnerable to accusations. Right, right, right. So is this kind of like the, um, it seems like a lot of the preface to this is that humans have this dark side to them at the end of the day. And many of the decisions that are made by us and others are likely because of these darker motives, which are probably truth, but it doesn't seem like it when we're talking to friends about asking why they moved to a certain country or why they are dating this girl or this guy or why, we're, why we chose this job or this job. They always have status virtuing about... You know, oh, we did this because we want to save the world or because, ah, oh, you know, we, I love the way she, you know, makes me feel all, all these different things um, are true in some sense. But you're saying there are there are some darker motives in there. Well, so the, the biggest surprises, I think, are ways in which we all lie about similar things the same. <laughs> and so we aren't really ready to challenge other people. So like. If you're a rival of mine and, and you do something for one reason and I have a different theory of it and now we can argue about that, well, at least we're sort of aware of the two different stories. And maybe we're aware that sometimes you're right and sometimes I'm right. But there are some kinds of things where we all tell the same good looking story about the same sort of things. And then we might not realize that we're all wrong together. Uh, Give me an example. Those are the areas of our life where, where maybe we're just all mislead misled so um our um one of the early chapters in our book is about conversation like conversations like this one sure and we'd say well why do people talk like this what's the point and if you're looking for a good story about why we have conversations like this a very simple easy plausible story is that we're sharing information that is you know some things i don't i know some things you don't uh, when we share information, we'll both know more things, and then we'll both be able to go out into the world with this extra information and, you know, be more informed. And that's a good story for you and a good story for me and a good story for all of the, the people we are talking to. Sure. So we'll all sort of latch on to that nice sounding story for all of us. Yeah. And then we might not question that. We might just see it's the story everybody gives, and we always give the same story, and it all makes sense, and then we're done. But that story just doesn't fit a number of details about conversation. Mm. <laughs> that story suggests, for example, we talk about the most important, valuable things to us, where in fact, we tend to talk about relatively trivial things. That story suggests we'd be reluctant to talk and eager to listen, where it is in fact, where it's more the opposite. That story suggests we'd keep track of debts. And I, so I've told you three things and you've only told me one so far, so you've got two to go. Uh, but we don't keep track of debts that way. So the story just doesn't fit a number of basic features of our conversations. And a better theory is that we are showing off. 
we each have a mental backpack of tools and resources. And the, or the rule is that the conversation will just wander in ways neither of us can control. And whatever comes up, we're each supposed to pick something out of our backpack and, sh and have it be relevant. Clever, witty, interesting thing to say <laughs> to connect whatever the topic is. Mm. And in that way, if somebody can just play that game well, you can be convinced that, well, whatever you needed from them, they probably have something in their backpack for it because look how consistently they're able to pull something out of their backpack every time a new topic comes up. Sure. And that's a reasonable thing to be doing, except we're not supposed to be bragging. So humans have long had a norm against bragging, and this is kind of bragging. It's showing off. And so we don't want to be accused of showing off. And so we have the other story. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, I can totally relate to that. I can totally relate to that. Um, it kind of reminds me, uh, well, this kind of leans into towards status as well. I'm not sure where you. uh, you're frozen. Oh, uh, you still got you're me back now. Yeah. Now you're back. Yeah. I, uh, I was just saying that this, this kind of leans in towards, um, what you talk about status as well. And I'd be curious to get your thoughts on how you think status has changed throughout human history uh, compared to kind of the modern times it, and what, what has kind of stayed the same as well. Uh, so status is just the general process by which a community agrees on evaluating people. <laughs> and communities have varied across space and time in terms of all sorts of social norms and other contexts, and that's also made them vary in which features of people they most value, uh, what counts most as status. So say, you know, 500 years ago, military courage and ability was a much larger factor for men, certainly. Um, you know, fertility and um, nurturing of kids was a much bigger factor for women for status. Um, and you know, society has changed and we've changed what we value. So certainly education has become a much bigger thing. And now we value education more than we used to in terms of status. Um, things that have stayed the same, of course, are wealth, uh, social connections, being articulate, witty, um, having allies, <laughs> um, you know, and, and just knowing things before other people about you know, news and local events, um, uh, physical health yeah. <laughs> has been always high status, but again, it, you know, today we might express that more in terms of exercise or hiking or something as opposed to fighting, uh, or war. Uh, so there have been some changes, but overall the main things that count for status haven't changed that much. Yeah. And well, I guess physical health around activity, it, doesn't that in some sense kind of boil back into fertility in that if you are, let's say, a man that is being able to do backflips or run across uh, different cities because you are so physically fit, it means you're more bred to have healthier babies as well? Well, it does. it is a good sign about that. Yeah. The question is just whether we care as much. <laughs> so there is this enormous drop in fertility over the last few centuries. Uh, I think is a deep and important puzzle. We could talk about it if you want. We, we don't discuss that much in Elephant in the Brain because it's not so much about hidden motives. Yeah. But I think we can talk about that. There is a, a way to understand it more. But first of all, you have to realize it's a puzzle. It's, it's a pretty deep and basic puzzle. Uh, pretty much all animals through all of history for billions of years uh, have tried to have as nearly as many kids as they could. And when times were good, that was usually a time to have more kids. Yeah. Uh, and then when, if you had a famine or, or, or harsh, you know, cutback in resources, then that might be a time to delay or pause on having kids. But then as soon as the, you know, things got well again, you'd, you'd go back. And in the last few centuries, we've had this remarkable phenomena among humans where we've gotten much richer and more stable and healthy world with less disease and less, all, all sorts of things going wrong. And we've dramatically cut back on fertility. So something very weird is going on there. That's that's just way out of the usual practice of other animals. Yeah. Uh, and even humans in prior history, it's uh, humans even generally had more kids when times were good. 
Uh, and yet we have this very consistent trend in the last few centuries. So that's has to be something weird. Basically, something is going very wrong. <laughs> and you know, in evolutionary terms, I'd have to say somehow we are misfiring on our evolutionary uh, instincts. That is, somehow this situation we're in looks like something where to our ancestors, this was a good time to cut back on fertility. That's the instinct we're reacting on. Somehow this environment we're going, oh, well, this is a good time to cut back. And, but of course, in some objective sense, that's kind of crazy. It's not a good time to cut back, but our evolved instincts are clearly telling us, no, 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 this is the time to cut back. And so the question is, well, where did that instinct come from? Well, how, what's, what, what sense could it have? And I, I have a story about that, you know, a speculative story, but first thing you have to realize it's pretty puzzling. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, just the idea that for this is for hundreds of thousands of years and, and, and beyond just humans, but animals as well, we've evolved to recreate and to produce life. And, um, I would say even in the last 50 years as, uh, not just our instincts have changed, but external factors have changed among society and equality of women. Now women are starting to earn, um, and, and become independent with the ability to work and rise in their jobs as contraceptions. There's, there's all these external things that are not just playing to these internal instincts that we've evolved towards. Uh, but you know, things have changed on that, on that side as well. That seems to be making some differences in terms of what's happening. Well, so, I mean, the world has changed enormously in the last few centuries. Yeah. <laughs> and so explaining any one of those changes is complicated by the fact that you have all these other candidate changes to use this explanations. Uh, any one of the other changes could be contributing to each change you're looking at. Uh, but you'd like to come up with as an overall story to explain the whole package of changes in some simple, simple way that, that could make sense of all of it. And some of the changes seem more exogenous or from the outside and others are more in the system. Um, I would say the most fundamental thing that changed is that we were able to produce more wealth more quickly. Hmm. That is, I mean, that was caused by other things, but in some sense, I think of that as the most fundamental cause of most of the other changes <laughs> as we can generate wealth more quickly. We've been able to generate wealth faster than we grow the population. So the wealth per person has been increasing. Right. And so we're just been becoming a rich society. And the question is, why would that cause other changes? Because you see a lot of other changes and many of them might be hard to understand. Yeah, but why would rich people tend to do those things different? Hmm. Uh, so I have a sort of a most general story about most of the big changes where that's coming from. And then I have a more specific story about the fertility change. Yeah. Um, the the fertility that, change but... would, would be great to go into because, because are you saying that, if, if, please like, correct me. Are you saying as we get into more greater wealth, so like the capita, uh, GDP per capita, uh, as that has increased, I think in the U S now it's like 75,000 or something that is going to reduce the willingness for families or individuals to have more babies. Right. So, so the, the data about fertility is that sort of the most consistent long-term correlation is that as individual societies get rich, their fertility falls. And then when we look more specifically at the causal factors, it seems to be mediated by some general perception of changes in what counts as status. Oh, so, okay. Please um, go on. you know, we look at say the first place where fertility fall really became clear was in France because it was the first European country to be, to get rich. And in rural France was where it first showed up. And it seemed like rural, relatively rich rural parents were cutting back on fertility uh, when they perceived that other parents were doing similarly as a way to sort of increase the status of their kids. And that was sort of the first thing, but we've seen in a number of other studies in say India and Brazil, we have studies where like radio became more common or TV became more common. And we see that the spread of certain kind of TV shows or radio shows depicting new family habits, which were seen as high status, had a substantial causal impact on fertility patterns. 
Yeah. And we even have like earlier history in England that uh, when, when people sort of heard about other people having these different perceptions. So the larger story, I, you know, the, the larger data is it's, it's very consistent overall pattern that as societies individually get richer, they have higher, they have lower fertility that tends to start at the higher end of the society. That is the rich subcultures tend to do that first. Mm. And then it does seem to be tied to a perception of what counts as status in that subculture and basically desiring higher status kids. Yeah, this, this <laughs> that is that you can either have more lower status kids or fewer higher status kids, and they're choosing to have fewer higher status kids. So that's the proximate data to work with. And now I, I can give you a theory to try to explain that. But that's roughly the summary of the data, I would say. No, please, uh, please, please share the, the, the theory um, around that. Okay, so the theory is that in the last 10,000 years or so, you know, after we transitioned from being foragers to farmers, we lived now in larger societies. Instead of, say, roughly 30 people in a van, we had maybe a thousand people in a little village area. And in societies like that, there is a slot in the society for someone who's a king or queen. There, there's a, a top person in the society. So they, they are much less equal than foragers were, and they are more hierarchical, and there's often a, a position at the top. And the position at the top comes with some pretty big rewards for fertility. That is, the king and the queen get to have a lot of kids and grandkids. Okay? Mm. And so it's once we had king and queen as a role in societies, now we evolved this, this evolutionary question, well, for who should go for it? Who should try to be king or queen? And how best to do that? And I would say in, in, a, in a great many societies, in order to be a candidate for king or queen, it wasn't just enough to be healthy and say, have friends or something. There was usually a cultural markers you had to acquire to be considered a candidate. So, you know, you might need to master poetry or archery or dressmaking or, you know, hiking or, just, or war or something like that. For in any particular culture, there's a set of cultural markers of elites that would make them candidates to be king or queen. And so you really wouldn't be considered for king or queen unless you had sufficient cultural markers of that sort. And these were cultural markers that took a fair bit of time and effort to invest in, to, to learn archery or poetry or whatever it is that any one society, you know, thinks you need to, to show that you are a cultured person who could be to go to the right parties and the right events and show, show yourself in the right way, such that people would think that's a candidate for king or queen. And so uh, there would be this basic question, well, that's expensive. <laughs> so should I invest in myself or my children all these cultural markers that would make us a candidate for king or queen, where we would know how to wear dresses right and serve food right and do poetry and archery or whatever it is to do it right. And in order to seem a good candidate, you'll have to do those things well, not just do them minimally, but you'll have to seem elegantly and, and quite good at them, basically. Uh, that would be the sort of person someone would pick for king or queen was somebody who not only knew the basic cultural things, but could do them well and impressively, right? That's, that's what you'd have to be shooting for. And that would take a lot of time and effort in addition to having a kid who was actually like pretty good at stuff. Yeah. Okay. That would be the kind of package you'd need to make a shot at this, this, uh, coal. So the question is who would have a good shot at that? And then I would say, well, in general, if you're looking at what resources you have to, to make a venture at making your child king or queen or yourself king or queen, you'd basically be looking at wealth. If you were relatively wealthy, <laughs> then you could afford to spend a lot of time and money on your children to invest in all these things. And that would also come at the cost of fertility. That is, you, what, what you'd have to do is invest a lot of time and money in these skills and not have as many kids so that you could focus on the fewer kids you had and really try to, you know, make them a good candidate here. Right. So the story would be in the last 10,000 years when king or queens were a thing, at least, a, you know, king or queen of a thousand people isn't what we usually think of as a king in our world because we're thinking of such big states. But long, long ago, a king of a thousand people was still a king. <laughs> okay. So, um, so that it would make sense then for the people who are the most rich and successful in a society 
you know, those 20 people maybe to, to them thinking about taking a shot at being king. It wouldn't make sense for all thousand people, but maybe for some special elite subset, they would have a shot and they should, they should take it that seriously because it has a, has a big potential payoff. Yeah. So I've described a theory that a behavior where some people would reduce fertility, that is the most elite people would cut their fertility as a strategy to, in the short run, to become king or queen and then have enormous fertility success once you get there, right? Yeah. So Resource overall, allocation. It, would work, it would just be a short-term cutback. Sure. Right? So now, I mean, this theory I've described says that when you have high relative wealth, you have a shot at being king or queen. And maybe you should go for that if, as long as you, you know, your kids are healthy and you have good connections and other sorts of things, but then you'd have a shot at that. Now, that's not enough of a theory yet because I'm going to need to add a mistake because <laughs> in our world, we're clearly making this enormous mistake. <laughs> so I need an evolutionary theory with a mistake in it. So somehow evolution needs to be looking at the wrong thing a bit and mis misfiring off of something. And so here's my misfiring story. Up until a few hundred years ago, average wealth in society has almost never changed. Mm. Most everybody was poor. That was just a constant of the human condition for a million years. So when evolution was trying to encode this heuristic, if you have high relative wealth, then take it, you know, cut back on fertility and have a shot at being king or queen. It didn't actually have to look at relative wealth. It didn't actually have to say, well, look at your wealth and compare it to other people's because other people's was pretty much always constant. It worked. It would have worked fine until a few hundred years ago to just say, just look at your absolute wealth. <laughs> if you have high absolute wealth, then you have a shot at being king or queen. And you should consider, you know, if you have the other markers go right, you know, cutting back on fertility and then going for that. And so the story, we evolution encoded the heuristic in terms of absolute wealth, <laughs> which until recently would have been fine because the average wealth almost never changed. And then we had this amazing change in the last 300 years where average wealth increased yep. and the whole society got richer together everywhere in the whole world and in particular the society. And it wasn't just a temporary rise that would, you know, fall back as in the past. This has been a consistent centuries long increase in wealth. And so now the story is, well, now we're all looking at our absolute wealth being high and we're all going, we're all going, I have a shot being king or queen or my kids have a shot at being king or queen and so i'm going to cut back on their fertility and invest in sending them to school and extracurricular activities and music and sports and dress and just give them all the cultural markers that might make them be a shot at king or queen yeah because we all feel rich and we all feel that our kids are pretty good and that they have a have a chance at that and everyone is trying to be king or queen and the mistake is that we're not looking at relative wealth. We're looking at absolute wealth, right. which used to work fine as a heuristic, but now it doesn't. It doesn't, you're saying, because um, not everybody can be king and queen? But isn't there still enough? Right, so the whole idea is it only makes sense for some small fraction of people to take a shot at being king or queen by cutting their fertility, because <laughs> there's not very many king or queen slots. Right, right? but in today's society, uh, though, can't you still pour those resources and you may not be king or queen but you could like there's so much wealth today for everyone in society that even though like it's not you're not going to be the 0 0.0000001 percent like the king and queens back in the day um you could choose to have less kids because that kid could still go to stanford or the top 20 schools and right. still do better but than the far majority they might do better, but the reason in the past was to do that. It was that if they became king or queen, then they'd have lots of grandchildren and great grandchildren because right. the king or queen would have lots of potential ways, maybe many wives, many illicit relationships. Like they could just have enormous fertility from being king or queen. Hmm. And that was well worth the investment in trying to get your kids or grandkids to become king or queen. Cause that would just be the big payoff. But today, you don't get that payment from your kids going to Stanford. <laughs> right, 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 right. Uh, that is, they'll go to Stanford, they'll make a nice income, but they won't have very many grandkids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's an so the fertility theory. payoff isn't there anymore. Sure, sure. Assuming that the fertility payoff is what the ultimate goal is in the minds of the person. And that is a evolution 
evolution. That's the ultimate goal that it's going for, right? See, but, and our instincts are designed by evolution in order to help us achieve that. Hmm. But we will just continue with whatever our preferences are, regardless of whether they deviate from what evolution wanted. Yeah. (laughs) Evolution took its best shot at encoding its preference and it is on our preferences. But now that we want our kids to go to Stanford, (laughs) we just want that even if it doesn't lead to more grandkids. Right. And that's kind of where like status might come in and all these different uh, kind of the dark, dark, dark uh, motives that we might have that maybe we're not so keen on admitting or talking about openly. Um, it, it's a really interesting story that you just brought up. I, I have, uh, um, I remember my mom telling me that because she's a, she's one of six daughters and um, sorry, five daughters and, one there's one uh uh brother that she has so she was the only son my uncle and i remember her telling me that back in the day sons were at least in korea which i'm I'm, i don't know if it's the case in western cultures were kind of the coveted child back in the day because they tended to be the most helpful in terms of bringing back resources since so many things were manual labor, working in farms, working in um, more, just more physical labor jobs. And a lot of the reasons for having kids was because that they can actually help around the farm and help around the house uh, so that the family as as a whole can can thrive in in terms of being able to support each other. I wonder if there's also a case for most people wanting more kids back in the day in order to to be able to do that. And you look back into now in today's society where the main leverage or lever after the industrial revolution, uh, as we started producing more cotton, became m- less manual labor and human labor, but into more machines. And now there's software and algorithms, automation, robots. I wonder if there's some correlation between the less need of families to have humans around <laughs> this sounds like so so like dark and robotic but just trying to be as logical as possible here that just the less need for humans around and and the idea that like listen i can have one kid and i can we can support our whole family there's more wealth there's more automation there's less human labor needed to for us to survive and thrive in society and as a and as a family Do you think there's some logic to that? So, you know, a key feature about the human mind and other animal minds even is that evolution didn't just directly encode in us its preferences in an abstract, simple sense. It didn't just say, you want as many grandkids or great grandkids as you can, go figure out how to do that. That's not how evolution encoded our preferences. In some sense, I think that will happen in the future, and that will be sort of the simpler answer. But evolution just didn't have that available as an option in the past. So it couldn't just tell you, you want more grandkids, just do whatever it takes to get that. So the way it tried to get you to do what it wants is to give you more local proxies as the things you want. So for example, you might feel lust towards someone and then want to have sex, and that might result in kids, and that will advance evolution's goal, but not because you were trying to do so, but because, you know, in context that you, your ancestors were in that, that worked, that was good enough. So when we think of what we want in our minds, we have this amalgam of all sorts of different things that we're kind of confused about and don't understand that well, and that conflict with each other. And we're not even sure which ones are more important. And so when we think about having kids, that's the kind of things we bring to our minds. And that includes things like, well, gee, how much work needs to be done on the farm and how much could kids help or something? And then you'd think, well, well, what kind of farms do we have and do we need them now versus in the past? And those are, you know, ways in which we are using these proximate heuristics for what we want and applying them to our situation to figure out what to do. But the larger story behind that is all of that was just a proxy (laughs) for evolution's point of view, getting you to do what evolution wants. And we're we can reason pretty abstractly about evolution. We can now understand, well, it's really clear what evolution wants. It really just mainly wants you to have more great grandchildren. That That's it. That's the whole thing. And all the rest of the stuff is just a path to get there, but that's not what's in your head. Mm. So, um, you know, the, if we say, well, you don't need kids on the farms, so you don't have as many kids. 
that works from the point of view of what you're thinking about and what you feel like you want, it doesn't work from evolution's point of view. If evolution said, no, 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 I was trying to get you to have kids and this was just a, a trick <laughs> and you're sort of misfiring on that. So yeah, evolution's strategies were pretty robust. That is, if you know, go back a few hundred years, the sorts of things that evolution made people want to do worked in a pretty wide range of environments to get them to have kids and to get them to have nearly as many as they could. Um, it was only when we started getting in some pretty weird environments compared to the distant past when these heuristics started misfiring and that it, it didn't work to get us to have more kids. And then basically now evolution just has to slowly like trial and error, find something else that will work. And that's the process we're in at the moment actually is, uh, the trial and error of biological and cultural evolution to just see what different packages of cultural elements and preferences, et cetera, could get us to want to have more kids. And so far it hasn't been working very well. That is, it hasn't really found <laughs> stuff that works very well, but it's, it's got, you know, another thousand years to keep trying. Probably we'll find stuff. Although I'm worried about what it'll find. So I, I do mm. think this is a sort of a, basic issue about humanity over the next coming centuries is that we do seem to be in a fertility decline and will probably result in a population decline starting within the next century. And that decline could just continue on for several centuries until some subgroup manages to find a way to have a high fertility cultural inhabit. And the problem with that is we, we now have some subgroups who've had relatively high fertility, but apparently they are not insular enough compared to the outside. That is people in those cultures, they, you know, grew up in the larger culture and they assimilate the larger cultural habits and, and values. And then they don't that consistently continue on with the culture that their parents grew up in. And so even say someone like Mormons in the United States or, or the Amish or, you know, um, Orthodox Jews or other sorts of high fertility cultures, it's, it's really not very clear that they are insular, that they are able to resist the outside cultural pressures to, you know, prevent their children from becoming like everybody else. And so yeah. I think what it will take is that some very insular culture arises that is very able to tell its children, don't listen to anything those other people say, stay away from them all, stop listening, you can't trust them, and listen to our culture only and stay in our culture and we will tell you what's right and we will tell you fertility is great and they will maintain that fertility within that subculture by maintaining a high degree of cultural insularity. Seems, That's, I think, what seems it very would unlikely. Take. <laughs> unless, unless well, you're unlikely talking about Mars and like, what else you got? That is, yeah. There, I don't really see another solution in the next thousand years. Yeah, that would work better than that. So that's got to show up, or we all die. <laughs> um, and but I think it's more likely to show up. But the main thing I worry about is just a culture that's that insular, that's that distrusting of outside cultural influence, that's willing to put up that strong a barrier between outside cultural influences and the inside that it's trying to protect. Such a culture may well cause a lot of other problems in the world. It will be, you know, resistant to innovation. It will be resistant to, you know, market integration with the rest of the world. It may want to be spatially isolated. It may be militaristic, hmm. um, you know, it may well reject a lot of technology and other social innovation that we've adopted. That's the big worry I have is just what else will they reject yeah. in the process of producing this cultural insular world that will allow them to finally create a high fertility culture. I, I don't know how much off, off, off in your head you can think about, uh, the speed of drop in population. I mean, it seems like everybody's talking only about how fast population is increasing and, and, and obviously like climate control, these things. But I don't think people are talking about the potential like drops in population that we're experiencing. And but are about but if you, if you look at the graph of for each nation, say it's fertility as a function of time and, you know, and as a function of its wealth, you will just see a very consistent pattern. And you will see that most of the rich countries in the world are actually already below replacement fertility. Yeah. 
that is, and it's only the poor nations that are having above replacement fertility, but those fertility rates are falling at really quite rapid rates. Because they're poor countries and are even becoming say, more wealthy. Like, right? Even India right now, India is now down at replacement fertility. Yeah, even India and um, in Africa, they're 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 seeing greater levels of wealth and and right. so so we're you know we're this is coming down the pike. This is a real thing. It'll take centuries to play out, but the question is in the past when people were doing fertility forecasts, what they would do is they would follow the fertility line down and like the UN went had a forecast. Whenever fertility would hit like the replacement level at two point two or something, they just flatten it out. And they say, ah, and that's how it'll look, right? <laughs> and that's not how it's happened. <laughs> when fertility's hit down to 2.2, it kept falling. It's going way down. Like there are some places that are down at 1.2. <laughs> what I'm curious uh, so, about... Oh, there's a lot of really low fertility out there in the world. Yeah. What, what I'm curious about is... K Korea is one of those places, as you, as you might know. Like Korea is one of the lowest fertility places in the world. Yeah, that, that's the thing, right? Like people aren't even getting married there. People are having uh, common law partners and so often not even living together. I mean, they're just kind of living in their own bubble. And uh, Japan has also done that. I, I don't know. I don't know the cultural reasons behind that, but I, I can. I could totally see that's what you're talking about. Like it's Korea and Japan are, are uh, wealthy countries, and right. So I just asked Google right now, and Google says the current in 2020 the fertility in Korea was 0.84 births per woman. So decreasing, basically. Whereas fertility would be like 2.1 or something. Wow. So we're down at like almost one third of replacement fertility in Korea. Damn. What about Japan? Probably lower. I don't, I don't know, but it's easy to ask Google, of course. Uh, it's down It's down at 1.3, which is, you know. Korea's lower. Better, but still. Right. It's substantially lower, right? But still wow. 1.3 is way, be way below 2.1. Wow. They're still on a like a strong downward turn. So this is this and this is like just true consistently around the world. The rich countries are below replacement fertility. So it's a real thing. And so it's a real puzzle, like why? What's going on here? And then what would it take to replace it? And again, the most striking thing is that we've seen some subcultures that had high fertility, like say the Mormons or the Amish or you know, um, Orthodox Jews, but if you look at their fertility, it's on that same downward trend rapidly with wealth. And they're basically seeming to only have a delay relative to the outside culture, but they are very, their children are very much being influenced by the culture they're in. Hmm. And they're apparently not sufficiently insular. Yeah. <laughs> they are, you know, they're, they're, they are not preventing their kids from assimilating the outside values of the world they're in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how do you solve that? How do you solve, how do you force people to have more kids basically? We, I mean, it's, it's mostly a culture thing, right? Cause on these timescales, the biological evolution is just too slow to do that much. So yeah. whatever solutions or changes are happening will mostly happen through cultural. And so the question is how do you create a culture that values high fertility? And people have done that in the past, but then how do you make that culture be insulated hmm. so that the main you know, descendants of that culture are mainly caused by the ancestors of that culture as opposed to the outside world? Because as you know, people in our modern world are pretty mixed culturally. Like they watch TV, they go to schools. Especially now. Yeah. You know, they, Netflix. They, 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 and they mix on very large scales. And so that makes it very hard for any one subculture to deviate from the larger cultural habits and values. Uh, Robin, I'm curious to know with this shift in less fertility and, and, and men and women, not even though evolutionary, this is what we are built to do, but from a society perspective, we're, we're just, we're not creating babies. This isn't the reason necessarily logically for us to be dating how does that affect attraction and sexual attraction, particularly in what we look for partners, what we desire in, uh, in a, as a society when we look at our partners? So, so the, the key thing to know about humans is that we are very culturally plastic. Um, plastic meaning we are, you know, changeable, like mm. moldable. We, we can become different things. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, there are some relatively constant things about human nature and human societies, but there's a lot of things we're willing to change. 
And so as we talked previously about cultures vary in what they count for status or which things count more for status. And cultures vary, of course, in say their languages and which professions are dominant and you know how they respect their elders and all sorts of things. And of course, one of the things that varies is attraction. So in some sense, you know, one of the main elements of attraction is people want to be attracted to the same people other people are attracted to. Hmm. So, so that they can, you know, whoever you, if you successfully pick someone, you'd like that to be one other people would pick. So like if you have kids together, their kids will be kids. Other people will like to make with, right? So you're, there's a big coordination game and attraction, which is you want to have the same sort of attractions as others. Uh, so that means different cultures can just have different attractions. <laughs> And that can be stable to some degree. And so um, that's part of cultural variety. Um, and that means you, in order to know who you're attracted to, you have to grow up in a culture which tells you who you're attracted to. Yeah. And tells you what features of you other people would be attracted by such that you could mold and emphasize those features. Uh, that's a, another thing you'll learn in growing up in a culture. Uh, different cultures will just value different things. Um, but, but there are these long-term trends that are relatively constant across cultures. And so that's one of the main things to notice about humans is which aspects of them are things that are culturally encoded that vary by culture and which things are pretty constant such that pretty much all cultures have the same thing. Right. We all want and so, what other people want. Right. That's one for sure. And surprisingly, this decline of fertility with wealth is a pretty robust thing that it's, it's happened across the world, across a wide range of different cultures with a wide range of different styles and values. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, they've all consistently had this fertility fall as wealth has gone up. So it suggests it's not just some local cultural thing that we can just change by doing another cultural variation. It's something deeper. Sure. Yeah. Um, so around, around the idea of like fertility and, and surviving as a family and producing the best babies, <laughs> You know, we had Dr. Drew on the show and he talks a lot about for us as men, we look out for women that will likely produce the healthiest babies. So we look for all these uh, features in the woman uh, and, and, you know, physically and emotionally, mentally, is she a good mother, all that stuff. And for a woman, she looks for a man that could provide for her, provide security. And I guess in our world, that is being you know, providing financial security, being able to provide them uh, a roof over the, over the families, but with less of the desire to have kids and a family in today's society, how, how does that affect, like, does, does having those financial resources still play as big of an impact in choosing partners for a woman? And uh, how, how does that impact it now that we're having less kids? Well, let me tell you my basic story for most of the changes over the last few centuries, which is a, a slightly different theory than the one I just gave you for fertility. So this is so over the last few centuries, we've seen increasing wealth. And along with that, we've seen increasing leisure, decreasing war, decreasing religion, decreasing fertility, um, increasing travel, increasing art. Um, increasing democracy, decreasing slavery, um, increasing egalitarian sensibilities. Uh, we've just seen a whole bunch of trends over the last six centuries that are pretty consistent overall cultural trends. And the basic question is what caused all these trends? <laughs> How do these trends you know, follow from say increasing wealth? We see a fundamental cause of increasing wealth. And then we see all these other things that have changed with it. So, my story there is the is the idea that the biggest thing that ever happened to humans was the wrenching transition from forager to farmer. So we lived as foragers for a million years, whereas where we were lived in these very small bands of roughly 30 people, where we were very egalitarian, where we didn't have much property, where we didn't even have marriage, uh, we didn't have lifetime relationships. We you know agreed on things communally. We uh, didn't, you know, we had sexual jealousy, but not really fighting wars. Uh, and, you know, we lived like that for a million years. And then we were culturally plastic enough that when farming became possible, we were able to change to become farmers, 
but that required some pretty large cultural changes. Farmers accept inequality, uh, ranking and domination. They have slavery, they have war, they have trade, they have property, they have marriage, they have less leisure, they have less variety of food, they have less, less travel, less art. Um, this really farming life is really quite different and it requires substantially more self-control and that was aided by religion and um, conformity pressures. And there's just a lot of t things that humans brought to bear in order to just turn foragers into farmers. Farmers are just different than foragers in a whole lot of ways. And basically most foragers would look at the farming life and go, that's just terrible. That violates most of our rules. That's, that's hell. And, but somehow over, you know, 50,000 years or as long as it took enough cultural evolution was able to slowly change foragers into farmers. And that was a wrenching transition, but we succeeded. And then for the last 10,000 years, most everybody have been farmers. Hmm. They've lived like farmers and foragers were only like the tiny marginal on people on the edge surviving, you know, away from the farmers. And then the industrial revolution made us suddenly able to grow wealth enormously quickly. And my story is by making us rich, it, it cut into the mechanisms by which we had turned foragers into farmers. <laughs> that is, the, more than many of those mechanisms were mediated by poverty and the threat of death <laughs> to cause someone to to act like a farmer. So as, as a concrete example relative to your question, if you imagine a farming young woman of age, you know, 16 or 18, and she thinks she's in love with somebody and she wants to have his baby out of wedlock, and she doesn't care about that, right? She's in love and she just wants to do this. And that society will tell her, you're thinking of doing this and I get that, but look at these other concrete examples. You and your child may starve. <laughs> Hmm. Our society doesn't treat that very well, and it, we punish that often, and we have mechanisms set up that that doesn't go very well. We reward people who follow our norms, and the people who violate them, they get punished, and they often die. And a typical farming young woman, that was persuasive. It convinced her to not follow her instincts, and to go with the rules, and to get married, and to do things the usual way in order to, for that she and her child wouldn't die. And then in the last few hundred years, as we get rich, a young woman has the same inclinations. And then she looks around her and she sees other people have children out of wedlock and they do okay. They survive. They don't die. Right. They have enough money to live. They can raise their child. It's not wealthy, but it, it, it happens. It works. Yeah. And that young woman is less persuaded to follow the official rules of society that she should you know, get married and follow the rules. And she says, if I want to have a baby now with this guy, I'll just do that and that'll work out. Mm -hmm. And so the threat of poverty and death is just less persuasive to make her follow the old farming rules. Um, and in parallel, just the whole story is that over the last 400 years, we have more looked inside ourselves and say, what do I feel like doing? <laughs> who, who cares about all these rules? What do, what do I want to do? And we've just done that more because being rich, we can. We can defy the rules when we're rich. And yeah. so we've drifted back to forager attitudes at least outside of work over the last few centuries. And that explains most of the trends. Most of the trends are ways we've gone back to being more like foragers because foragers were more promiscuous, less religious, um, more travel, more for, for more uh, leisure, less religion, less war, less slavery, uh, more equality, um, more democracy. These are all forager features, hmm. even less for fertility. Foragers had lower fertility. And Basically, most of the trends over the last few centuries can be understood roughly as us going back to forager attitudes as we get rich. And the major exception is work. That is, the reason we're rich is because of modern workplaces. And in modern workplaces, we are not very forager. Like, we are actually more hyper farmer. Like, we are actually accepting more domination and ranking that most farmers wouldn't put up with. Certainly, most foragers wouldn't, but even most farmers wouldn't. And we put up with that. Yeah. At our workplaces, which is the goose that lays our golden egg. That's the thing that makes us rich. And so we are, in some sense, schizoid. We are split. <laughs> Outside yeah. of work, we are the returning to forager, leisurely, grand-minded, relaxed person who enjoys travel and every democracy and everything else. And at work, we are, we do what we're told <laughs> in a way that farmers would not. I, I want to go back to that part about, um, like, bosses. Um, but I, I have a theory and I'm going to put it out there, which is um, I could, because society has always evolved, right? We've we've gone from 
certain trends and and we've we've we we, we kind of we we go back and forth right we web and flow and is there a chance that as we have more robots taking over jobs humans live in better societies so we're still wealthy we'll still have the riches that we want but there's a lack of purpose there because a lot of the times the work that we do the the nine to five that we show up to is what allows us to wake up every day to get excited and to meet colleagues and stuff but as robots are automating a lot of jobs humans need more of a purpose and a lot of people kids give them purpose having babies and a family is what we lead towards in terms of the ultimate family fulfillment and, and purpose that we have. And is there a chance that we have this control and return back to fertility as robots take over a lot of the workforce and now humans need to figure out a way to find purpose in their lives? And that's where babies become more of a scene now. <laughs> So we're, we're a long way off from robots taking most of the jobs. <laughs> yeah. So far, robots De are definitely not a decade changing the jobs. Yeah. Uh, and, and I can tell you about sort of some statistical analysis I've been part of to analyze robots or automation replacing jobs. So yeah, if please. If you want to go into that, we can. But um, the, the larger story is that there's two main sort of ways to evaluate people's you know, lives, happiness and meaning. So uh, happiness is more, I ask you at the moment, how do you feel about this moment? And meaning is more when I ask you at the moment, how do you feel about your whole life? Right. Your life and your place in the universe. That's meaning. So meaning asks you to take a larger assessment and happiness asks you just right now, how are you feeling? And what we've seen about happiness and meaning is that as people get rich, they get happier, <laughs> you know? Richness makes people happy. So your life at the moment when you're rich is just a nicer moment. You're, you know, you're comfortable, you're not hungry, you're not in pain, you know, you're just happier as you get rich. But meaning hasn't consistently risen with wealth. That is, people in poor lives in the past weren't so happy, but they had a lot of meaning. And people even today in poor worlds, they have a lot of meaning and they get a lot of meaning from their suffering, <laughs> from the things they're willing to suffer in order to get the things that are meaningful. So that is the fact that they're suffering reaffirms to them the meaning they're getting out of the things they're suffering for. Sure. And they're suffering for their family or for their religion or for their nation and for their ro professional role in the world. They have as much meaning as rich people. So, but as people have a choice to get rich, they do tend to choose it. <laughs> and so even if people choose a life of leisure which has less meaning it's not clear they won't still make that choice <laughs> uh it's not clear that people are actually willing to to choose suffering in order to get more meaning right uh that's a choice sometimes some people make but i don't think it's clear that that's like an overall trend hmm. seems to me the safest thing to say is that as people get more chances to be rich and lazy and <laughs> comfortable they will just choose that <laughs> They'll complain about it, maybe. They'll complain about how they don't have meaning in their lives and, and they and it's all meaningless and it's all and you know, rich people today, especially in the United States, they complain a lot. It's it's you know, being happier and rich doesn't mean you complain less. And usually means you complain more, I think. That is often the reasons people don't complain is they're afraid to complain. That is if they complain, people might react badly to them and punish them and fire them and stuff like that. So it's often people who are very comfortable and secure who do the most complaining. Sure. Uh, yeah. So I would expect to see a future of a lot more complaining, a lot more people saying, why is like, this is all there is to life. And why isn't there more? And why aren't people doing more for me? <laughs> Even as they get richer and have to work less and have to take care of kids less. And, um, there, there's fewer, less war and less, all sorts of struggles that they need to be involved in. Then they'll just keep complaining even more. Like that's already happened. You're saying more of that's going to happen. I mean, that seems a straightforward prediction. Yeah, yeah, like as people get rich over the last few centuries, they have felt more entitled. They have felt more like they deserve more, and they have been more willing to complain about what they don't have. Oh boy, 
not excited for that. Um, I wanted to go back to what you brought up around dominance hierarchy. You, you talk a bit about reverse dominance hierarchy. Um, well, talk to us a little bit about what that is. Obviously, there's dominance hierarchy, so the reverse of that. Uh, for people don't know, no, don't know anything about that world. So, our distant forager ancestors lived lives quite different, say, from previous chimpanzees or other primates. <laughs> Primates had pretty social worlds, and they had social coalitions within larger groups, but these coalitions were pretty competitive and um, harsh even, and they sort of grabbed stuff for themselves and took advantage of that. So within a primate group of, say, chimpanzees, there'll be a top coalition of the most dominant primates, and they will grab the best food and the best mates and take them the safest places to sleep, and that will just be their advantage, and they will fight as necessary with other coalitions in order to be at the top. Humans managed to have substantially larger social groups in part by suppressing that sort of competition for dominance of a group. Humans basically made the rules with norms that there is no subgroups. There's the group, and that's it. And all of the group is going to help the whole group, and no subgroup should really claim that they are distinct from the group and say that they're better. They shouldn't threaten to you know, hit us if they, we don't do their thing. That is, we're going to have a coalition of the whole group that says there are no subgroups and there is nobody who's better than anybody else. And humans for a million years did that. They succeeded in having coalitions of groups where no one was to be dominant. Now, there's two kinds of status, dominance and prestige. Humans made this distinction. We said dominance is a no-no. So dominance is like physical force, having more resources, giving orders, that's bad. That's no, we're not, not going to allow that. For prestige is what an admirable person, how handsome, how capable, how articulate, how skilled. I like this very impressive person. I'm going to watch them and copy them and listen to what they say. I admire them and will take their advice. That's prestige and that's okay. It was okay for there to be more admired people, but they couldn't give orders. They couldn't act like they thought they were better and they couldn't threaten physical force. And that was the new human equilibrium. And that's how humans live for a million years. And then as we reverted back to farming, we accepted more of this dominance that foragers hated, but primates and all most previous animals had put up with and accepted. And so basically farmers accepted more dominance. There were kings, there were lords hmm. and there was slavery and there was dominance was more of a thing even though most humans resented it and didn't like it so basically you had dominance between classes but within classes you had more egalitarianism most people spent most of the time within the same sort of class of people sure. so they didn't actually have to directly deal with dominant lords or kings but that was there right. in the last few centuries as we've drifted back to forager styles we have become more resistant to dominance we are more so bosses, say 200 years ago, you can look at records of bosses. They yelled at their employees and they even hit them sometimes. That was, that's what bosses did, but bosses don't do that anymore. Yeah. Bosses rarely give direct orders. So bosses usually say, it would be nice if, uh, I wish this could happen. <laughs> They're cautious about being overtly dominant. And even so, most people just have to dislike bosses as a matter of principle, just because bosses seem to be somewhat dominant. Everybody just has to hate bosses in general, but they tend to think their boss is okay. Other people's bosses are bad. And this is one of the reasons why people hate the rich and disapprove of their being rich because that's seen as dominance. And it's just, it doesn't matter what objectively the rich actually do and how helpful they've been. If just, it's just bad that there are rich people <laughs> because that's just, you know, anti-dominance now. And that raises the question for bosses, how does a boss function? and get people to follow their orders in a world where people are very wary of the whole idea of somebody giving orders and there being dominance. Mm. And so I think that means that a major function of bosses in our workplaces is to get people to follow orders in a way that they find acceptable. So, you know, when you ask, what is a boss for? What do they do? You might say, well, somebody needs to coordinate activities and tell people what to do and things like that. And that's, that's important. But I think an equally important function of bosses in our world is just to get people to find a way to, with self-respect, do what they're told. <laughs> and I think the simple way that bosses do that is just by trying to be prestigious instead of dominant. And that's why we pay a lot for bosses who are tall and handsome and articulate and hardworking and smart 
not necessarily because they need to be that to do their other functions, because that makes you look at them and say, they deserve to be there. They're prestigious. I'm willing to, to follow them. Uh, it's, 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 I can have self-respect and still follow them and follow their lead because they are legitimately prestigious. Ah, it's interesting. Yeah. So the idea of us being told what to do kind of reminds us that we're, f that we're being dominated. So we kind of trick our brains to think that we oh, hate that and we're mm. supposed to hate it. We're, we're supposed to not have, we're supposed to have enough self-respect to just resist and hate Yeah, and resist domination. That's the forager norm. So do we just trick our brains to make our bosses or people that we look up to or that we have to follow as more prestigious than, than they actually probably are just so that we can- Right, but we need materials to work with, right? We, we're right. willing to self-deceive. We're eager to self-deceive, but we need some material to work with. Yeah. <laughs> Which is why they need to be tall and handsome and, and hardworking and, and smart uh, and knowledgeable. That's what it takes so that we can convince ourselves they are sufficiently prestigious to to do what they say, hmm. to do what they hint. <laughs> yeah. They'll hint at what they want. They don't even directly order. They will, they will hint enough about what they want so that we will voluntarily do it. Wouldn't another be um, incentive contracts around playing to someone's own selfishness and incentivizing what they have to do with a reward, which is the whole typical carrot on the sick analogy so that they can you know, no matter how prestigious the boss is, it's more about carrying right. out your own selfish motives. So with incentives and incentive contracts, you have to be wary of the implicit dominance of an incentive. So we can frame incentives as you're offering me a reward that I'm, I could do without, but I might like, and I might go for it if I think it's a legitimate thing you're suggesting I do for a reward. But if what you're implicitly threatening is to hurt me, if I don't do what you say, well, that looks like dominance and mm. I am supposed to resist. So you have to be careful when you offer workplace incentives to employees to not be appearing to threaten dominance. Like I'm going to fire you if you do the following things. Uh, that, that looks more like, you know, a dominance threat. Now, if yeah. I think it's those would be terrible things to do and you sh that's quite legitimate to threaten that. So like we have crime laws in our society where we do threaten to use dominance to punish people who violate the crime laws. But most people buy into those laws. They, they think they are legitimate laws and they think they should be ashamed if they violated those laws. So they aren't intending to violate them and then that's okay. But at the workplace, if, if you're saying here's, here's things you need to do. And if you don't perform well enough, we're going to punish you. And I'm not so sure I can even meet these standards. Well, that sounds a lot like dominance. That sounds like the slave master throwing the whip at me, right? better do it or he'll whip me. And, and we're not only, we don't like that. We resent that. Like, mm. That's I'm, I'm better than that. I shouldn't have to like be in a situation like that. So we have to be careful to sort of be offering more carrots than sticks. If we're trying to avoid triggering this sort of resentful reaction where people see themselves as somebody's trying to dominate them and that's not okay. Yeah. That makes um, sense. That makes and so, sense. you know, offering promotion on the basis of exceptional performance raise it. That's, that's more of a prestigious thing. Well, if we decide you're especially prestigious, then we're going to, you know, you, you're going to get some rewards that would be the just desserts of someone who is more prestigious and okay, I can, I can be okay with that. Hmm. But the threat of being hurt, like, you know, losing my job or not getting paid enough to eat this week because of something that I don't think I'm fully in control of, that's scary. And that can be demotivating and to make people mad and frustrated and try to retaliate and sabotage. That's right. So to, to wrap up here, Robin, knowing all of the motives, the hidden motives that we've discussed and that you've learned researching this book, um, what can we take away what can we move forward with here that can be more applicable to our lives, whether it's our career, our love lives, whether it's understanding ourselves, what are the things that key takeaways that we can leave the audience here with that can be useful for them? So 
I probably should have told you at the beginning of all this, but I'll tell you now that evolution designed you not to know this stuff. Its best guess is you were better off not knowing. Uh, but I've told you anyway. So it could be that your best move is to just forget it and pretend like you never heard. It. And that's actually pretty feasible. Most people are quite capable of forgetting stuff that they don't want to remember. Uh, that is, evolution decided that you shouldn't know about these hidden motives and you should be ignorant and you're better off being naively pretending to have other motives than knowing the real motives that you have. That was evolution's judgment about your mind. It didn't tell you this stuff and it could have easily. It decided not to. So should you know this stuff that evolution decided not to tell you? Well, the main reason to know would be as if your situation is substantially different than what evolution anticipated for you. That is, it didn't guess right. Like we were talking about with fertility, evolution didn't guess right about what to tell you about fertility. It might not have guessed right about other things. So you might be in an unusual situation where understanding your and other people's motives isn't especially important to you. You might be in sales or management, or you might be a social scientist or policy wonk. If it's your job to actually know why people go to the doctor or why they go to school or why they vote, because your job is to actually recommend changes to how we do those things, then it's your job to know what really going on. Yeah. And sorry, then it might not be so pleasant or maybe some, you'll have some, you know, personal fallout from knowing things you shouldn't know, but Hey, that's your job. You signed on to that. So you should learn what's really going on in those areas uh, because that's your job. Now, if you say, no, none of those was my job. Um, okay. I'll say, well, fine. Here's my last thing. Like some people are very socially smooth. That is, they have a good social intuition and they glide through the social world doing roughly the right thing at the right time. They don't know exactly why they do it, but they do the right thing and it works. If that's you, then you can probably glide on your social interest, intuitions too. And maybe you don't need to learn this stuff, but some people are like me. We're kind of nerdy. We're awkward. We, we don't just glide through the social world doing the right things. Usually we typically do wrong things and we make mistakes. People don't like it because our intuitions aren't very good. For people like me, it can be helpful to actually have a conscious theory in my head of like, what's going on? Why do people like some things and dislike others? Because then I could try to consciously use that to maybe step on fewer toes, mm. maybe not make as many people mad because I was violating their expectations. And that would be a reason why you, as a person who is unusually nerdy and maybe smart enough to like read this stuff and figure it out, maybe you should read it and figure it out. So if that's not you and none of the other exceptions are you, I'm honestly sorry. You shouldn't have heard this stuff and you should just forget it. Sorry. I mean, you've got a ton of stuff here around um, body language, conversations, consumption. Um, I mean, all the things that we just talked about around dating, which I can guarantee most people are going to be very interested in. Um, so I think whether it's around your career, your relationships, your own understanding of why you make certain decisions, I think it's I a good I can offer rate. you insight into why you make decisions, but I have to warn you, insight isn't always useful. Many people thrive in the world and achieve better things because they're wrong about themselves and the world. And the world rewards people for being wrong about themselves in the world. We're not actually in a world where you are consistently rewarded for being truthful and accurate about yourself or other people. Um, there are some places where the truth is valuable. And if you are in such a place, then I got some truth for you. Yeah, I think that's our audience. But so not everybody's in that situation. I'm sure the uh, growth minded folks here listening were curious to dive into their brains. And so I would highly recommend people to check it out. It's called the elephant in the brain. Um, and um, obviously, it's a, uh, it's, it's a highly recommended book that we're going to link down below as well. Uh, Robin, where can people learn more about you? And uh, where should people be directed to? Well, general, just my name is the basic access to most of my stuff. You can Google my name and find my web pages at hanson.gmu.edu. You can find myself on Twitter at, at Robin Hanson. You can uh, find my books at my website, The Age of M, Work, Love, and Life, and Robots Rule the Earth, and The Elephant in the Brain, Hidden Motives in Everyday Life. Um, and 
you know, I'm relatively easy to find because of all the people with my name, I'm the person who shows up on the web most often. <laughs> if I had more competition for attention for my name, then, then it would be more trying to show you how to find the parts that are associated with me as opposed to others. But thankfully, at least at the moment, uh, I'm the one who's most popular with my name. There you have it. The best Robin Hansen out there. <laughs> Check him out, guys. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you, Robin, so much for your time um, and all the insights that you provided. I learned a lot just by researching our conversation and uh, all the insights that you brought up. So always love these conversations. And um, thanks so much for tuning in, guys. Check it out. Thanks,